It's a great honor to introduce our keynote speaker tonight. And I'll start with, at our morning session, you heard our CEO, Patricia Levesque. And she said that part of the purpose of this conference is to hear all these great ideas, and we want all of you guys to steal them. Well, our keynote speaker, I have to confess, there is nobody that I have stolen more from than him. I first met him in 2011. I just got elected, and we had a conference with our elected officials. And there was this speaker, and he spoke. And he was so eloquent, and he was talking about having a philosophy and following your philosophy. And I sat there in the audience, and I thought, man, th this is fantastic. Well, about three or four months later, I called the delegation meeting with all our legislators, and I basically gave verbatim the poor man's version of that speech. And I told our colleagues, we got to be about philosophy, and we got to do all this stuff. Two years pass, and I open up the New York Times, and there's an article, and it says, how do you determine happiness? So I read this article, written by the same gentleman, and if you have never read this article, I would tell you all, Google, New York Times, how do you determine happiness, Arthur Brooks. It is absolutely something you, you should read, you should have your children read, you should have your neighbors and friends read. So I read this whole article, and then I got invited to speak to a graduation ceremony at a college. And it basically was, how do you define happiness? Stolen from Arthur Brooks. <laughs> the final one is, I started following him on Twitter, because I thought, you know, if I see something on Twitter that he does really fast, I could steal it even quicker. <laughs> so I followed him on Twitter, and I found out he has a book coming out called The Conservative Heart. So I pre-ordered it, and I'm waiting and waiting. I finally got the book. I read it from cover to cover in a single day. And then I had to have my designation ceremony where I was chosen as speaker, and my speech was basically a conservative heart. <laughs> and so I will tell you that it is a great honor to introduce to you guys a, a phenomenal individual. And, and as much as it is an honor, it is also with great sadness that I introduce you to him. Because I look across this room and I think there is now, at the conclusion of his speech, a thousand more individuals who will absolutely steal his material. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to introduce to you the president of AEI, Arthur Brooks. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much for that gracious introduction. What an honor it is for me to be here with you, Dr. Rice, with all of you who are the warriors in the front lines for fixing the education system and, and making sure it continues to be a beacon of hope for people all around the world. Um, I'm the president of the American Enterprise Institute, and, and as uh, we do a lot of work on education reform, some of you know the work that we do. We're honored to do it to serve you and serve this community of practitioners, of warriors for the people who are going to make these ideas real in the lives of children, in the lives of families. Thank you, and God bless you for this work that you do that's so important. As I was getting ready for this talk, um, I was reflecting on the fact that I'm probably educationally the least qualified person to talk about the right path to take in education. You see, when I was 19, I dropped out of college. Dropped out, kicked out, splitting hairs. <clears throat> and I thought, I didn't need any education. I went on the road as a musician. That's what I always wanted to do. I was a classical musician. I played the French horn. And I played all over the United States, made almost no money. I wound up ultimately in the Barcelona Symphony. And I was playing in the Barcelona Symphony. Uh, I started my family there. I got married. And when I was in Barcelona, it was in my late 20s, <clears throat> it occurred to me that I wanted to study a little bit. I wanted to answer some questions that I'd always had. And uh, here's the big question I wanted to find the answer to. See, and it related back to music itself. I had been interested in the answer to this question. Why do I do what I do? Now, you're the reformers for America's education system, and you tell people that a lot. What do you do? I work in the education system. I'm, I'm a public official. I, I do public schools. You, you, you have a, a ready answer to the what do you do question. But what do you say when people say, why do you do it? What's your answer? Is it about morally what's important? Well, why do I bring this up? This brings me back to what I was doing in the Barcelona Symphony. During those years, I had a favorite composer. 
composer of music. Now, if you like classical music, you know who this composer is. And if you don't know who this composer is, you have to go out and listen to his music, because it'll change your life. His name is Johann Sebastian Bach. Maybe the greatest composer who ever lived. He, he was born in 1685, and he died in 1750. And he was pure productivity. He published more than a 1,000 works, orchestra works, chorus, chamber music. He wrote for all different instruments. And by the way, he also had 20 children, which is productive. <laughs> <clears throat> and Bach, near the end of his life, after his glorious career as a teacher and a composer, he was asked by a minor biographer that, that his answer is preserved for posterity. Herr Bach, why do you write music? Right? The why question. And it really haunted me. Why do you write music? Because I wanted to know why I did what I did too. Here was his answer. Here was his answer. The aim and final end of all music is nothing less than the glorification of God and the enjoyment of man. Hmm. And I looked at that and I thought, what if somebody came to me and said, why are you a French horn player? Would I say the glorification of God and the enjoyment of man? Probably not. And so I went in search of a better why. Hmm. And I started studying. I started expanding my mind. And the thing I got most interested in, weirdly, was economics. And I started studying by correspondence. I wound up getting my bachelor's degree shortly before my 30th birthday, and then went on to graduate school. And I, I became an economist. And I was an economics professor at Syracuse University. And and I asked myself that again, <laughs> if somebody said, why are you an economics professor, would my answer be, for the good of my fellow men and women? Hmm. Maybe, maybe. But then, then I got to answer that question right. And the answer to that question is what I want to discuss with you tonight. And I hope it will be helpful as you think about the why of what you are doing. See, now I'm the president of the American Enterprise Institute, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C., where I live, so you don't have to. <laughs> and AEI, thank you, it's just how I was raised. And AEI is dedicated to freeing people. AEI is dedicated to bringing the blessings of the American system to the people who need those blessings the most, those who have traditionally been left behind. And I know that's what you're about, too. Let me tell you why the why of my career, the why of my life, is finally fully satisfactory. The way I learned it from Bach. Here's the reason. It really goes back to the first time I saw poverty. Now, when I was a little kid growing up in a working class neighborhood in Seattle, I was, there were a lot of people around us who were hard up on welfare, broken homes. But... I remember the first time I saw real poverty. That was a picture of a kid from sub-Saharan Africa with flies on his face and a distended belly in the National Geographic magazine. You remember that picture or something like it? Remember the first time you saw that, that reaction that you had, a revulsion, the shock, the shame that came from living in a world where you could be well and that child could be starving? I remember that feeling, <laughs> and I thought to myself, how... How can this be? Well, I grew up and didn't study, but started my family, went to work. And occasionally my mind would go back to that kid, and I would say, what happened to him? What happened to that kid in that other part of the world? Well, fast forward to studying economics for the very first time in my life. Now, I wasn't attracted to economics because I thought economics was cool, because God knows it's not. I was attracted to it because through the study of economics, believe it or not, I was able to answer the question, what happened to that kid? See, not that kid specifically, I wish I knew, but to the poorest people in the world. And this is going to get to the why of my life and the why of my career here in a second. See, here's what I learned. This blew my mind in my late 20s. I learned this. Since I was a child until I was an adult the percentage of the world's population living in absolute poverty, a dollar a day or less, the percentage of the world's population living at that level from when I was a kid until I grew up declined by 80%. Hmm. Now, 
I didn't know that. I bet a lot of you didn't know that. Nobody knows that. If you ask Americans what has happened to world poverty, 70% of people will say that hunger is worse than it was when we were children. That's incorrect. So you got to ask yourself, and I ask myself, what did that? What lowered world poverty by 80% since I was a kid? In Washington, D.C., people will tell you that it's the fabulous success of the United Nations or the International Monetary Fund. Somebody just laughed. The, 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 the World Bank or U.S. foreign aid. Those are good things, but that's not what did it. Five things pulled two billion people out of poverty since I was a child. This is what I learned in my late 20s that changed my life, that brought me to what I do today. You know what they were? Globalization, free trade, property rights, the rule of law, entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship, which includes innovation at all levels, including what you do. It was, in short, the American free enterprise system that started to spread around the world after 1970 that pulled two billion people out of poverty. When I found this out, I said, I, I got to shout this from the rooftops. I got to talk about this more because, you know what, I, I don't really care about the free enterprise system per se. I don't care about, you know, wealth and, and tax breaks for billionaires. I don't care. I couldn't care less. What I care about is finding a way that we can lift people up out of poverty that we can lift people up into an opportunity society that we can give more people a better life. And I found it. I felt like I'd found gold in my backyard. <laughs> I started talking about it. And, and you know what? I mean, I, I firmly believe that if you want to help the poor, you must give alms because it's good for your soul. But you also have to system, have a system that works while you sleep of abundance for people all around the world. This became the why of my career. And I wanted to talk about it with everybody. And that's what I've dedicated myself to. That's a why worth talking about. Now, there's a wrinkle to it that we also have to discuss. See, uh, I talk about free enterprise constantly. I do 150 speeches a year. I get to travel all the time. It's wonderful. It's a blessing. I'm grateful for it. And I'm on college campuses all the time, and, and I taught at a college camp. I taught at Syracuse University for a long time. But now when I go onto these college campuses and I talk about the free enterprise system and lifting people up, a free society based on entrepreneurship, you know what the kids say? They say, yeah, I'm down with that totally. I want to be part of that. I want to be a warrior for that. But, but, you know, it seems to me that when we talk about capitalism and we talk about free enterprise, that we're talking a little bit about making money a little bit too much. It seems like They'll say, people your age, which hurts my feelings, they'll say, people your age are always trying to get me on a hamster wheel. So good for free enterprise to lift people up in the third world. Fantastic. And even poor people in the United States, that's great. But what about me? And what about my soul? What is it going to do to me? What's my answer? i got to take it seriously. Look, i got almost college-age kids. i got to tell them something about it. Is it a good thing for them as well? Well, I want to tell you about a study that really affected me when I read it. It was about goals and how life goals affect happiness. Okay, now, this is a study by two social psychologists at the University of Rochester. They undertook this study, uh, uh, they published it two years ago. And what the study did was kind of ingenious. They took 150 graduating college seniors, 22-year-olds, and th they said, imagine your life in five years. You're 27 years old, okay? You're five years from now. And imagine that you're successful and happy. What does your life look like? Okay, that's ingenious because nobody says, I'm successful and happy, so bad things are happening to me. They say what the good things are in their life. And that's how you ascertain people's goals. Okay, and they basically found two things. Half the kids had what the researchers call exogenous goals. Okay, why the fancy word? Because they needed to get tenure. So, <laughs> and what are exogenous goals? Exogenous goals are basically money and fame, power, right? So half the kids, mostly men, but not entirely, said, I want to be making more money than my friends. I want to have a really great job. I want to be on the management track. I want to be the boss, okay? 
The other half, mostly women, but not entirely, had endogenous goals. I want you to remember that word because I'm going to come back to it. They had endogenous goals which were all about love and people and relationships. They said, I want to, have, I want to be close to my family. Uh, I want to have good friendships. I want to have a good religious life. They, a lot of them, crazy, 22-year-olds. You know what they said? I want to get married. Hmm. I mean, marriage is supposed to be really passe for college kids. Uh -uh. A lot of them will privately tell you that they want to get married. Okay, so it's half and half, endogenous goals and exogenous goals. Why do I bring it up? Because they came back five years later and interviewed all the kids when they're now 27, not kids, and they found out how their lives were going. And what did they find out? Good news and bad news. First, the good news. Everybody in the study hit their goals. Okay? The kids who wanted to make a lot of money were making more money than their peers. They were on the management track. They were doing really well in their careers. They were working lots of hours. The kids who wanted to have good relationships had close relationships with their friends and their families. And they had a good religious life. And the ones who wanted to be married, by the way, were either engaged or married. Almost all of them. Hmm. When somebody tells you, you know, I, I'm doing really well in my career, but what I really want is something in my personal life. Say, uh-uh, that's not what you really want. The truth is, careful what you wish for, because you're going to get it, according to this study. Now, that's the good news. Here's the bad news. The bad news is, wrong goals, bad life. First, they looked at anxiety, then anger, then depression, and then life satisfaction. What do they find? That the kids with the endogenous goals about relationships and love, low levels of anger and anxiety, high levels of life satisfaction, high levels of happiness, low levels of depression. The kids who had these money-based goals and power-based goals, anxiety, anger, depression, low life satisfaction, headaches, stomach aches, other physical ailments. Mm, not so good. Wrong goals, not such a good life. Why did I tell you about that study? Because remember the anxiety that I get from college kids. Now, I've been talking to you about the free enterprise system that has lifted people up all over the globe. The innovation system that includes the innovation of ideas, by the way, that encompasses education reform that we're all about in this room. How do I adapt my ideology to people who are worried and nervous that this is just all a money-making venture. This was on my heart two years ago. I was thinking about it. How do I describe this? How do I talk about it when I go out on college campuses? What do I say? And at the time, I was traveling a lot to India. See, at, in, at American Enterprise Institute, we have an India studies program, and so I go constantly uh, to review what we're doing. And I was traveling with this guy who's a scholar on India, and, and, and I told him my problem. Look, I'm a total believer in abundance, right? The problem is that kids are suspicious because it's not good for us. What do I tell him? And he says, oh, when we get to India, I've got a guy that you want to talk to. Hmm. I said, what's his name? He said, his name is Swami Gyan Muni. Swami. So I said, so you want me to go and ask a Swami about capitalism, is that right? And he says, yeah, yeah, okay. So we, we got to India, and we went to this guy's, this guy's uh, ashram, his temple. And it, it's a beautiful place. It's called the Swami Narayan Akshardham Temple. It's in Delhi. It's, it was cut out of pure rock by 10,000 stone-cutting artisans over a seven-year period. It's a wonder of the modern world. And when we got there... I, I was marveling at it, but I was waiting for the Swami to come talk to me about capitalism, about free enterprise, and I was nervous. How am I going to be able to communicate with this guy? And I see him coming across this courtyard. It's a hot day in May. He's coming, bright sunshine, and he's got this shaved head and an orange flowing robe, and he's looking all meditative and mellow. And, and, and he, he clears up whether or not we're going to be able to communicate immediately. He gets real close to me, and he says, he looks at me, and he says, how you doing? <laughs> and, and I said, where are you from? And he said, Texas. <laughs> and, and this is weird because, you know, we're, I'm, I'm thinking about the why of life and how to explain it in abundance and all this. So I go to India to ask a Swami about capitalism. It turns out he's from Texas. So I said, you've got to tell me your story. And so he tells me his story. It turns out he grew up in Houston because his parents were engineers, that they, had, they were immigrants, and, and, and they had exogenous goals, lots of education, lots of money. They were very ambitious about their son, 
And so, you know, he graduated from high school at 16. He made him very proud. He was the valedictorian. And then he went to the University of Texas on a full scholarship and graduated in three years. And, th and then he got his MBA in one year. And this is getting really weird, right? Because there's a Swami with an MBA who's from Texas, and I'm going to ask him about capitalism, and this is not what I was expecting. And, and, and then he went to work for McKinsey, and he said he was making more money than he'd ever expected, more money than his dad was making, and his parents were very proud. He said he didn't have any time for relationships. He didn't really have a girlfriend or see his parents very much, but he was making lots of money and his career was on the right track. Okay, well, <laughs> the story goes that when he was 26, he woke up on his birthday and said, is this it? Is this just what I got to look forward to? Just money and work for the rest of my life? So he decided to pray about it, and he did. He was a pious Hindu, and he prayed about it for six months, and at the end, he made a decision to sell everything he owned, give his money to the poor, move to India, join a seminary, and become, after six years, a Hindu monk. Huh. Now, I have come to a Hindu monk who has renounced all things and rejected capitalism. I've come to ask him about capitalism. Hmm. But I asked anyway. I said, Swami, is capitalism good? And he said, no. It's great. It's the only system that has pulled people out of poverty by the millions in my country. And I said, but look at you. You gave it all up. It's a man-made prison, isn't it? Isn't money bad? And he said, and he was, by the way, he was calling me dude, you know. He says, he says no, dude. Money's not bad. The problem isn't money. I said, what's the problem? He says, the problem is the love of money. Now, <laughs> of course, the light bulb went on for me. I was raised in a Christian home, and the, the most misrepresented, misunderstood verse in the Bible is from St. Paul in his first letter to Timothy. Here's the, there, here's the misquote of the verse. Money is the root of all evil. Wrong. You know it. Some of you do. The love of money is the root of all evil. Swami reminded me of a Bible verse. Hmm. And it was really this. He said, do you want the, he said, dude, do you want the secret of happiness? And I said, yes, I do. He said, abundance without attachment. Hmm. And I went in search of that. See, this is the key. When we're looking for the why of our lives, we need to bring abundance to everybody. You're in the business of reforming education. Why? To give people better lives so that they can share in the abundance of this great country. But... What about abundance for you, and how do we treat it? That's the part where we don't become attached. You will not be able to sell this argument about abundance for everybody if people think you are a materialist. Sure as I'm standing here, you know it's true. So how do we get to the non-attachment part? How do we talk about these values? I'm going to give you two suggestions tonight on how we do this, how we fight for abundance for everybody with our unique characteristics through the free enterprise system and the system that you're working on to reform education for people who need it, but at the same time, avoiding the attachment that is a man-made prison. Practice number one, think about the things to which you are most attached. Give them away. What am I saying? Charity is the act of rebellion against attachment. For years I did research on this subject. When I was a professor at Syracuse, I would write books and technical articles about charitable giving. And, and when I was doing this work, I, I did it in relative obscurity because I was a college professor. We're all really obscure and doing sophisticated math work, etc. And something happened. In the middle of my academic career, I wrote a book that unexpectedly got popular. Why? Because in the book I asked this question. Who gives more money away? And I looked at all different groups. I looked at religious people and secular people and Democrats and Republicans and old people and young people. And when you compare people about something about virtue, you get a lot of attention. Okay, so suddenly, weirdly, I started to get mail from people. And I was just a college professor. I wasn't used to hearing from anybody. I mean, not even family, right? And so, um, and, I, and, 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 and it, was, it was actually kind of, it was, uh, it was disorienting. 
in a way. And when I was doing this research, um, I found a very weird thing that was even more disorienting. And here's what it was. I started finding in my research that the more money you give away, the richer you get. Now, it doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense. It was, it was a contradiction of my theories. Because when you're doing a PhD in economics, they don't teach you, if you want to get really rich, give all your money away. Mm -mm, that's not a good investment strategy. So I had a problem. I was finding in my data, the best data in America, over and over and over again, that you have the theory, and then you have the data in conflict. Okay? And I had a, I, that was a problem for me. So I did what all professors always do, which is when your data and your theory conflict, you get rid of your data. <laughs> and, and you hold on to your theory. <laughs> so... S but it was in my, in my mind, and, and, and I sat down for lunch one day with a, a colleague who was a, a psychologist who also did work on charitable giving. And I said, I have a data problem. I keep finding that the more money you give away, the richer you get. What am I doing wrong? And he said, what are you talking about? We've known that for 30 years. He says, but, I mean, we don't look at it in terms of getting richer. We, we look at something more important. And we found for many, many years that the more money you give away, the happier you get. Hmm, happier. And of course, when people are happier, their stress hormones fall, and they have more self-efficacy, and they're seen as leaders, and, and, and they do better financially. And so, of course, the light bulb went off. And, and the light bulb going off meant I started seeing studies every place. The more you give, the richer you get. The more you give, the healthier you get. The more you give, the happier you get. And, and here's my favorite. The more you give, the better looking you get. <clears throat> This is actually true. There are these guys who do these experiments. They're at the University of Liverpool. And, and what the experiment goes, men come in with their wives, okay? And, and, and the deal is they start out in one place with a guy in the white lab coat. And he says, he gives the men a pocket full of change. And he says, simple experiment. You walk with your wife in the pocket full of change over to that building over there. And my colleague is going to interview you for 10 minutes. And then you're done. And you get to keep the change. <clears throat> Good. So each couple sets out, jingle, 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 pocket full of change, and they, they get halfway between the buildings and there's an alleyway, and, and a homeless guy comes walking out of the alleyway, and he panhandles the husband. Hey, buddy, you, you got some spare change? He does, right? And, and now the husband has to make a decision. Do I give the guy some money or not? And, and he makes the decision, and they go on their merry way. They go to the other building, and the, the next psychologist is waiting, and he says, he says to the husband, did you give him some change? How much? And then he says to the wife, how much do you like him right now? Why? Because they're looking for the correlation between your level of charity and your level of attractiveness to your mate. And what do they find? The more you give to the homeless guy, the more she likes you. <laughs> News you can use. <clears throat> but here's the point. Here's the point. Do you want to believe in abundance and practice non-attachment? Then get into your head that to which you're most attached and give it away. Practice number two. Remember the endogenous goals from Rochester? Instead of using your resources to buy things, use them to acquire endogenous experiences with the people that you love. In other words, stop paying attention to the price of stuff. Start paying attention to the value of experiences with your loved ones. Years ago, um, I've been married for 24 years. And 23 years ago, just around this time, my wife and I were having this big knockdown, drag out argument about how to celebrate our first wedding anniversary, ironically. And, and here was the controversy, here was the argument. My wife doesn't mind if I tell this. Um, we, had, we were poor. Uh, she was working a minimum wage job, and I was teaching music so I could finish a college degree. And she, by the way, she was working on her high school diploma at age 29, okay? Talk about educational slackers. I have zero credibility with you people. And, and, uh, and, and we were having, and we had no money. I mean, you look at the checking account, and there's just tumbleweeds going through it. And, and so we figured out that we could just scrape and borrow enough to do one of two things to celebrate our anniversary. We could either go away to the beach for three days, or we could buy a couch. And we didn't have a couch. So what was the controversy? My wife, who's from Barcelona, is all about the beach. And I'm a practical, thrifty American, so I'm all about the couch, because we needed a couch. And this was the argument. Beach, couch, beach, couch. And we finally made a big compromise. 
and went to the beach. <coughs> and <laughs> so years later, we were contemplating this. 20 years later, we were contemplating this. And, and here's the weird thing. If we'd gotten the couch, which we ultimately did, by the way, it was gone after a few years, and I don't even remember the color. But I can tell you everything we did for every hour of that vacation. This is the paradox of things. The things that you think are permanent are not because they're just stuff. The things that you think are evanescent are actually permanent because they lodge in the ether of your imagination. They're in your heart forever if you do things with people that you love. Now, this is a point that we understand from the commercial world. There's a, a, a credit card commercial that's been running for 25 years. It's the most successful credit card commercial in the history of that industry. It's for MasterCard. You've all seen it. It's, a, it's, it's always the same. They recut it every year so it looks modern, but it basically looks like this. There's a, people doing something, and there's a voiceover. Okay? It's a guy getting into a car with a kid, and the voiceover says, <coughs> Beach Ball, $3.00. Gas for the car, $36. Two nights in a hotel, $275. The weekend at the beach alone with my son. It's just an ad, but it speaks truth. I could give you 12 studies or 1,200 studies that show this, but instead I'll just tell you how this finally landed completely in my life. I have a house full of teenagers. God bless me. <laughs> and uh, my middle son, his name is Carlos. And, I mean, Carlos, Carlos is a piece of work. I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. Um, <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> what, uh, uh, my wife and I were coming home back last year from a parent-teacher conference for Carlos, and it had gone very poorly, very poor, a grades issue. And, and we're in the car, and it's this icy silence, and finally my wife says, Here's how I think we need to think about it. At least we know Carlos isn't cheating. <laughs> so that's, that's my son, Carlos. And, and, and I mean, he's a good boy, but he's always, he's always got some angle that he's going on all the time. You know, the, the, the principal calls and he says, do you realize that Carlos is running an illicit underground reptile selling business? It's like, <laughs> what even is that? And so, anyway, so six years ago, Carlos is nine, and, and uh, he comes to me in the fall, and he says, Dad, I've been thinking about Christmas. Now, for an ordinary child, this would be charming, right? For Carlos, you're immediately on the defensive, because you know it's not in your interest what's, what's coming. <laughs> And he says, uh, no, Dad, no, 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 because I'm trying to divert attention. It's good to have Christmas in your heart all year round, Carlos, you know, that, that kind of thing. He says, no, no, I don't want anything. I've been thinking about it. Dad, this year all I want is I want to go away with you, hunting and fishing, alone, just the two of us. Hmm. And, I'm th and I'm thinking that costs 19 times as much as a bike, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, father of the year, right? But I didn't say that. I said, that's a, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And, and we did it. And we've done it every year since. Now, all he gets for Christmas, all he wants is to go away hunting and fishing between Christmas and New Year's. And I could buy him a bike or a scooter, and it'd be broken and forgotten. But I can tell you everything we've shot and caught every single year for six years. Huh. So that's the lesson. If you really want to be in favor of abundance, but unattached to the, the bounty that you bring in through abundance, then pay attention to the endogenous relationships. Invest in those endogenous relationships. So where are we? Now, I started off by talking about discovering the why of what I'm all about. And the why of what I'm all about is freedom for people who need it the most, just like you. You're not in the education reform business because you want to give a better deal to the children of billionaires. I love them too. But that's not the business we're in. We're in the business of bringing freedom to more people. That's what the free enterprise system is all about because it brings abundance to people all around the world. And it is uncontrovertibly true that it has changed the world and lifted billions of people out of poverty. We must, it doesn't matter what your politics are. Some of you are Democrats and some of you are Republicans. It doesn't matter. I don't care. I don't even care what I am. What we need to be about 
is being warriors for the system and the systems that lift people out of poverty. But at the same time, <laughs> we have to guard our own souls and the attachment that these things bring. What I'm suggesting is a new ideology that transcends the traditional left and right. And if we can do this, we can bring our country together. If we can do this, we can remember our true values. And then the battles that you fight every day get easier because they're not a holy war anymore. Because then we have a common currency of the moral consensus around which we need to build our country. Fighting for those who really need us and who really need abundance. And at the same time, protecting our values so that we, we remember that we're not just a material society. If we can do that, imagine, if we can do this together, how good things will be. I know you're fighting for it. The work that you do effectively is fighting for this. For what it's doing for our country, for the least fortunate, and for all of us in here. My only words to you are, God bless you, God bless your work, and thank you. Now, join us in welcoming back Dr. Condoleezza Rice for a special question and answer session with Dr. Brooks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, you've given us a lot to think about. <laughs> and... Um, I just have to take one moment to say we're both failed musicians, so that we have uh, in common. I'm going to ask a couple of questions to get us started, um, get your thoughts on a few things, but then we'd really like to open it up. And so if you have questions, there are going to be mic runners. I'll try to be able to spot you with your question, but if I don't spot you, get up and wave your hand vigorously. Um, I I'm a professor, so if no one asks a question or raises their hands, I will call on someone. <laughs> oh, man. So get your questions ready. I'm well, going to get called on first. I think. <laughs> you are. <laughs> You're going to get called on first. It's a wonderful defense of freedom and free enterprise and a wonderful defense of what it's done for the world. So why are we in a moment in our country where so many people have lost faith in the ability of this free enterprise system to deliver for all. We hear discussions of social immobility. We hear discussions of income inequality. And it troubles people. Uh, you can feel it in the kind of revolutionary mood um, out there. So what do you say to people about free enterprise and freedom and this marvelous system that has lifted people out of poverty and how we make it true today in America? Uh, I wrote a book that many of you, I got to sign for a bunch of you before, called The Conservative Heart. And it, one of the reasons that I wrote it is not because I'm trying to make you into conservatives, but because I'm trying to witness to political conservatives that they can remember really what's written on their hearts. Um, one of the biggest problems that we have is that the advocates for free enterprise in this country have forgotten why it really matters. When people who advocate for the free enterprise system talk about it as, as if it were just about the money, they objectify people, they, they hold mobility down effectively, and they don't deploy their unique resources for people who need it the most. And this is the, the biggest problem that we have in this country. I mean, we, when we look right now at the, the terrible bitterness that goes on between people who disagree with each other politically, you have to ask yourself, you know, what creates that? You know, personally, it's, it's difficult for me to comprehend. I'm from a liberal democratic family in Seattle, which is redundant because there are like eight Republicans in <laughs> Seattle. And, and I, I see the world a little differently than my family, but when I hear people on the, on, the, on the conservative side talk about liberals as if they were stupid or evil, they're talking about my brother. And I take that, I take that kind of personally. I don't quite understand it, but... But then when I reflect on it, I have, to, I have to recognize that we have failed in this country to remember that liberals and conservatives should be working for the same, should be having a moral consensus that the heart of the American experiment is pushing opportunity to the people who need it the most. That's what this movement is all about, by the way, is establishing that moral consensus. And if we can remember that moral consensus, then talking about capitalism and talking about inequality are not a holy war anymore, they're a competition of ideas. 
That's why this matters so very, very much. So when I talk to the people who are supposed to be the biggest defenders of the free enterprise system, political conservatives, I say, remember why it matters, which is not tax breaks for billionaires. It's for lifting people out of poverty. And if you can be the voice of compassion, and by the way, the voice of happiness, then suddenly we won't have so many people who are questioning the system, which is not unlike the gist of the remarks I just tried to make. Right. We're educators. Yeah. You also were an educator, and I think you told me you might even be an educator again one day. Yeah. Um, how do you think about the relationship of education to the ability to make the free enterprise system uh, work for everyone, to lift everyone out of poverty, to lift people up? What do we need to do? Because obviously, the folks in this room, whether they are legislators or uh, school board members or advocates for education believe that education is really one of our mm. most important levers mm -hmm. for lifting people out. Because you're right, the people in this room are concerned about every child, right. but recognize that there are children who are more left behind than others Absolutely. and don't want to see that happen. So how do you think about education, free enterprise, the, the system that we all love, but that is frankly under attack by so many. We cannot have equal opportunity when human capital is so disparate in this country. We simply can't have people starting behind the starting line so much and pretend that we're going to have an equal opportunity society. Now, you have to ask yourself, what's happened in this country where education has become so incapable of bringing people to the starting line? I know that people are different. I know that people have different skills and interests and passions. I, I got that. But I think it's more philosophical. That One of the things that we have to wrestle with, one of the things we talk about at AEI is the broad philosophical change that happened in education in America. About 40 years ago, there was a distinct change in the way that people started talking about educating the poor. As a matter of fact, a, a big difference in the way that we started talking about poor people in America. If you go back 100 years, the basic, I, now uh, there were a lot of problems 100 years ago, but the way people talked about the poor was as assets to develop. We didn't just casually put that poem on the bottom of the Statue of Liberty about giving us your huddled masses. Remember, who are the huddled masses? It's us, one or two generations ago. Everybody in this room, their great grandparents or grandparents or even us are just riffraff <laughs> with one, sorry, with one direction to go and that's up. When we forget that we're a country based on poor people, we're a country based on developing assets, and when you have a distinct sea change in the way that we see the disadvantaged and we start talking about them as liabilities to manage, you're going to do things differently. The way that I see the difference, that the ch big change in the public schooling system from the time I was a child is that we went from trying to see everybody as an asset to develop to seeing about 25% of the population is liabilities to manage, and you simply can't get people into an opportunity society when you're finding the best way to manage them at the lowest cost. Right. Let's open up for questions. I've got number three right here. Thank you, Peblin Warren, state representative from Alabama. What role has school choice in particular played in reducing poverty and improving an individual's chance for earned success? Thank you for that question. Um, we have seen in case after case, in community after community at the micro level, how school choice has been able to pull people toward this concept of earned success. It's been not every kid in every city at all, every time it, who's in a charter or who's in a school choice program has seen uniform success, but we've seen dramatic instances all kinds of data that show that these are good ideas because the people who need them the most are the most vulnerable. These are the people who need the choice and the innovation. The problem is that we don't have enough data at the national level because every effort that we've had to spread these ideas, to replicate the ideas of school choice, have been, have been squashed again and again and again. The problem is we don't have, look, 
It's a social science problem. We need to take this thing national and see the best practices and see what we could do at the national level. And we haven't been able to do that, which is why we need warriors like you who it doesn't matter what your political party is and what your political ideology is, you realize that we must, we have a moral obligation to work for kids so that these micro successes can be a macro cultural phenomenon. Okay, great. Number one. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. My name is Grant Callen, and I'm an education reform advocate in Mississippi. And you've touched on it, but you talk about how free enterprise has lifted billions out of poverty. My question is, is our education system sufficiently influenced by free enterprise? And if it's not, what would it take for that system to be motivated and influenced by free enterprise? Uh, my view is that the, the public education system in this country is insufficiently affected by the free enterprise system. It's insulated from the free enterprise system, which is, when you think about it, really crazy. It's one of the biggest industries that we have in this country amidst other industries that are being revolutionized by the free enterprise system to the great benefit of consumers of these industries. Why is it that these things are insulated? And the reason is because we think that it's somehow different. We think that somehow because this education is provided by the government, it shouldn't be exposed to the same forces of free enterprise and innovation. That's a huge problem. If you look at any successful industry where things get bigger and better and stronger and faster and cheaper for consumers, you find that they have two qualities to these industries. Innovation and choice. Choice is giving people what they want and need, and innovation is doing it better and cheaper. Those things are unambiguously always good for the people that they serve. Instead, in too many communities, and I know that this is heartbreaking for most of you in this room, we tend to see public education as a, a good way of giving great jobs to nice adults, as opposed to serving kids. If that's not the only purpose, then we're losing our way. Right. Uh, just on that point, because um, the American tertiary education system is the gold standard. And uh, it, it wouldn't be accused of being low cost, but it is innovative. It has variety. You can go to a small liberal arts college if that's going to be your best uh, option. You can go to a big research university. And it is competitive. Uh, there are options. And so it's always struck me that it's not education, it's K-12 education that we believe somehow ought to be insulated uh, from these forces that we understand. Yeah, that's right. Now, we could even have more innovation at the higher ed level if we, weren't, if we didn't have a cartelized uh, system of accreditation mm -hmm. of higher education. Okay. That would be a good thing to do, too. Yeah. Um, and, and let me tell you, I mean, <laughs> I'm the, I'm the product of correspondence school. I literally never saw my undergraduate education institution until they gave me an honorary doctorate and I had to go back. <laughs> I mean, if it weren't for a couple of alternatives, I wouldn't have any higher education at all. And, and I see a little bit of an attitude today among policymakers of trying to squash these types of innovations, of, of, of suspicion of anybody who's trying to do things differently, and, and we have to get away from that. I think that we have to be very careful, because any time that we do that, and I know that these are for the best of motives, but when we do that, who do we favor? We favor people with money, we favor people with privilege, we favor people who can do things the conventional way, and who actually is left behind? The people that don't have the benefit of doing things the conventional way, and so that's really, really important. There's another area of innovation, however, that I want us to all think about. When we talk about K-12 innovation, it's great. It's really, really important. But there are so many segments of our society that need more human capital development that they're being left behind too. What about the disabled? What about the incarcerated? What about people who've been displaced from their jobs? Why is it that we tend to think of K-12 education as, as one sort of uh, uh, block age group as opposed to thinking of every single person as an asset to develop at different places in their lives. What if we expanded our whole notion of what education is all about as an asset nation? If nobody's in a liability to manage, everybody is an asset to develop, then, then you who are the warriors for K-12 can be the warriors for our entire society. You could revolutionize our entire society if we expand our concept. Thank you. Number eight. Hi, Kelly McManus with the Education Trust. My question is going back to about two questions ago. And really it's about what are the messages that you have found to be most effective in challenging 
the idea of what education is about that you talked about has changed over the past few years or past few decades. What have you found to be effective in challenging the mentality about the quality of our schools and the quality of the education we're providing? Thank you. Um, I've been watching the education debate and, and, of course, participating in it as the president of AEI. And the education choice debate in particular is really acrimonious. <laughs> I don't have to tell you. I mean, you're, you know, you're taking a lot of bullets for this. Um, what actually has held it back? And the answer is, I believe, too many times education choice advocates have been in the business of fighting against things. Really fighting against everything, fighting against ideas from the other side, fighting against teachers' unions, fighting against bureaucracies. And I feel anger toward institutions that hold back poor kids too, believe me. But w if you look at any debate, you'll find that the side that's losing is fighting against things. The side that's winning is fighting for people. Any time that your argument is fighting against somebody else's idea or fighting against somebody else's institution, the other side is going to come back by saying, why are you fighting against these innocent, helpless, uh, meritorious people? And you lose. All of our arguments should remember the why of our movement, which is kids, which is families. You know, don't fight against teachers' unions. Fight against people. Fight, fight for the people who need to be free and to have choice. Don't fight against bureaucracies. Fight for the families and the teachers that need the innovation and the entrepreneurship such that they can provide, they can be excellent and provide uh, ideas better to the people who need them the most. If we move from fighting against things to fighting for people, we'll start to see more victory. Number six. Dr. Brooks, hi. Uh, Raquel Rodriguez, I'm a lawyer from Miami, Florida. We spoke earlier. Yeah. Um, you touched on this issue regarding special needs education. And I have a number of friends who are special needs educators. And whenever I raise the issue of choice and accountability and paying for performance um, of, of teachers based on the test scores of their students, they say, well, we have special needs kids. Uh, it's not fair. And I think what you just said in the last answer may be the, the response, which is you know, fight for things and more resources. But what can I tell my friends who are special needs teachers about how choice and innovation and accountability can help them in their work. If we had, thank you Raquel, um, if we had a nationwide market for excellence and best practices in the way that we treat people with disabilities, then we would actually understand what that market is supposed to look like. Your friends are worried, I know because I've had these conversations too, your friends are worried that their success with special needs kids are going to be baselined against other people's success with non-special needs kids. And they have a higher expense base, they have a higher level of, of, of effort that they have to put into these types of things, and so they're worried that choice is going to open it up to the wild west of free markets, and they're going to wind up not being able to do their work or not be rewarded for their work. Look, we got to compare apples to apples. And if we had a bigger market and more innovation and more best practices where we could compare what people are doing all across the country, then we would understand that really th th this is a segment of our population, part of our family, that we need to treat in particular ways. Instead, we have these micro markets where these rules are being set and, th and the comparisons are too small, and that's what these people are worried about. Fight for the special needs kids and try to knit together the best practices all across the country and how we can fight for them together. Number two. Hi, my name is Olka Hansen with Educating Potential here in Denver. What are the potential down pits, pitfalls of free enterprise and choice, and how do we make sure that we don't kind of run into them or guard against them? The, the pitfalls of free enterprise in, in education choice is just like the pitfalls of free enterprise in any public good which is to say that if you actually think that there's not a role for the government, you're, you're, you're fooling yourself. I mean, that would be basically like saying, let's just rely entirely on free enterprise to provide fire protection in the army. Pretty bad idea, uh, because we wouldn't, have adequate, we wouldn't have adequate security. We wouldn't have adequate fire protection. These are public goods. Let's not pretend that just because we want to bring free enterprise and the ideas of innovation in, that we don't need the... the the public sector and what we're doing. We're going to. We're always going to. Look, I, my belief is that one of the great blind spots of the political right in this country is this declared war too much on the welfare state. Um, uh, my belief is that we need to declare peace on the safety net. 
but to remember that we need to bring ideas like work and only providing welfare services to the indigent and having the equivalent of that in the public sector is equally true. What are we doing to be more innovative and rewarding more excellence and helping more people, remembering at the same time that it's, it's, a, it's a patriotic form of service to be doing it vis-a-vis -vis the state. That's what we have to keep in mind. We should not vilify government because it's the government. Take a couple more. Uh, number six. Thank you, Randy DeHoff from Littleton, Colorado. Been involved in education reform since uh, we passed our charter school law in 1993. Um, you mentioned the importance of free enterprise. My question is, um, how significant is the fact that we don't teach free enterprise generally in the public school system, and how do we correct that? Yeah, we, uh, the way to correct that is to teach free enterprise in the public school system. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing. Look, there are all of these areas that, we, that we, we don't talk about, that we sort of take for granted, but these, where, where we're losing basic skills and where we're losing basic intuition from kids. What, another area of this is citizenship. You know, what does it mean to be an American? We look at these kind of civics curriculums that aren't very good and catch as catch can, and part of what it means to be, to be a patriotic American is to, is to uh, be able to guard our freedoms. And guarding our freedoms means that we have to instantiate our freedoms in a commercial system. This is, by the way, if we're going to study the Declaration of Independence, which we increasingly don't do, if we were to study the Declaration of Independence and take to heart the second paragraph, which talks about the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we think about how those things can be embodied in a commercial system like the United States. We have no choice but to understand the free enterprise system. The answer is, we have a, I think we have a responsibility as educators and, and frankly, we have a responsibility as Americans to demand that American values that help people, especially the poor, be taught to our kids in the public schools. We need to stay in this fight. Thank you. Thank you. Kayla Efforts Cleveland from North Dakota in Governor Dalrymple's office. I'm feeling conflicted. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Rice, earlier today, you introduced me to a new word called communitarian. In communitarianism, taking care of your com community, being connected. And then we have this idea of school choice, of giving people options for a better, better education. What about our moral responsibility to take care of the infrastructure in the schools that we've started? Can you help decode that? Well, giving people choice doesn't mean neglecting our schools. I mean, there's the whole idea that somehow we, we, we have to starve the schools that people are moving out of. That, that's not necessarily the case. Now, I want to, I, th I think it's appropriate to expose educators and everybody else to market signals on the basis of excellence. But what we really want to do is to make sure, again, that we're not worrying as much about the infrastructure in terms of the the, the teachers and the schools and the buildings themselves, but rather how we serve the kids the best. We have to make sure that no child is left unprotected and then worry a little bit less about whether or not we're putting an adequate amount of money into a particular school building in a particular place. If we cover every kid and we follow every kid and we, we have enough resources for every kid, that problem, quite frankly, should take care of itself. Now, are we going to run into problems? Of course. Absolutely. We have, to have a, we have a moral responsibility to use the resources that we need as a society. That's what it means to be a believer in freedom and a believer in community at the same time. We can hold these two ideas in tension because we have the citizenship skills and the, and the intelligence to be able to do that. And, and that's the reason, by the way, that we can't go whole hog on just the idea of confusing the free enterprise system with the private sector. <laughs> That's the reason that we have to have these ideas together, too. But again, if we have our unit of analysis being the child, then that should not be a problem if each child is adequately covered with adequate resources. You've given us a lot to think about tonight, and I, I'd just like to close with one question to you. Uh, you talk about getting out of your comfort zone mm. from time to time. I say to my students very often, if you find yourself constantly in the company of people who say amen to everything you say, find other company. <laughs> We're having trouble talking across um, our differences, across our different opinions to one another. We seem to be talking at one another. In something like education, it shouldn't be that way because we can all agree that we have a deep moral responsibility and a, a deep need for our children to be educated. What would you say to 
this group and to Americans more broadly about our need to talk to each other about this important national priority. Thank you. And nobody has more credibility than you at talking to people who disagree. I mean, you've been fearless about doing this your entire career. Um, there aren't that many Republicans at Stanford. <laughs> um, True. Uh, <laughs> or, or in the Bay Area, for or that in matter. Or the Bay Area, or, or in Washington, D.C., or for that matter, um, all around the world, <laughs> which is a big part of your career. Um, one of the things that I like to ask the scholars at AEI, and that indeed I ask myself, is, is how many amens am I hearing? Or, or am I, I going to places where people find what I'm thinking about a little bit challenging? I think it's important and therapeutic for each one of us to think about the places where we can go where people disagree with us the most. I talk a lot with politicians. At AEI, we're, we're, we're right in the, the epicenter of the political debates of our time. We talk to the members of Congress constantly and the candidates for president all the time. And I always ask, you know, when I ask Republican candidates for president, you know, when was the last time you went to an NAACP meeting? When was the time you went to a union hall? And so I was like, yeah, look, I, I got limited time. You know, I'm, I got seven speeches today, then I got to go to the Iowa State Fair and eat a fried stick of butter or something. I don't know what, you know. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a terrible job, by the way. Um, so, but, but that's not the point, is it? If we're actually trying to do the math of understanding that persuasion is all about making your ideas more attractive to more people, it's pretty easy math as opposed to screaming louder at a smaller group of people for either commercial interests or basic ego, if we're trying to persuade people, then we have to get out and talk to people who might be persuadable. That means looking for, specifically looking for groups of people who disagree with us and thinking about how we can make common cause around the moral consensus of our time, which once again is pushing opportunity to the people who need it the most. So the challenge that I would give to each one of us here is to do something to find a group of people, even if it's your dinner table at home, the people, which in the case of my family is the people who disagree with me the most, um, is to, in the next two weeks, figure out a way to be more persuasive in the things that you care about, answering anger with love, and couching every one of your ideas on behalf of those who need you the most as a basic matter of brother and sisterhood. If you can do that, then suddenly you'll break down barriers, and suddenly we'll have uh, a lot more sense of what our common purpose in this country is. And it'll start with you. Thank you very much.